7th, coordination service for TAG Waterpark. There's a change in the time. It's not 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to be at 7.15 at the Newmanstown Church. So perhaps we'll that service and show support for TAG as he gets his coordination on that event. Also, in the vestibule is a sign up for volunteers needed for Old and Old Day. It's a great offer. Mission opportunity for us as a church right here in April to let people know what's going on with our church and to do some ministry for our community. Also, there's a sign up sheet going around this morning for meals for Hannah and uh, Bryson Brown as they had a baby girl this week. Uh, Thea Lynn. So we can remember their and their prayers as they begin uh, their family and, and being parents. Any other announcements? If not, let's pray and then we will begin and see. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the sunshine that cheers our hearts and hopefully warms our hearts. But Father, we also thank you for the rain that uh, you sent to, to water your creation and to take care of it. Father, uh, we thank you for your faithfulness in that area for many years. Father, we, we pray for Bryce and Hannah as they begin a family this week. We pray that you will continue to uh, just be with them. Be with all our young families here as a church as they are raising their children to, uh, to hopefully to, to fear you and to know you and to ultimately, hopefully, one day accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. We pray for the teachers who minister here to our children and to those who uh, work on Wednesday evening and to those who work in the children's church, Father. We have many opportunities to share your word. We were studying about being witnesses for you this morning in our Sunday school class. And Father, in order to be a good witness, we need to go and tell others. We can't just expect it to happen. And Father, I pray that you will help us to all be a witness. Now, Father, as we come here to worship, may we sing songs that will bring honor and glory to you. May we sing with an attitude to bring honor to you this morning. In your name we pray. Number 219, My Savior's Love.
continue to pray also for Margaret Rowe. Uh, she's recovering from uh, kidney stone surgery, and uh, she went in Friday for a one-day procedure there, so we pray for her as she recovers. That's why she's not here. Let's look to the Lord. Father God, we just thank you for all that you are doing in our midst, and as Ed has lifted uh, each one here up to you today, Father, we do pray for those who are fellowshipping together. As we look to you, O oh Lord, this morning, may you bless our hearts. Father, may you be working in us. May your Holy Spirit be moving and active here in your house this morning. Father, not only in this building, but in the temple that we've given our lives to you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help us. Help us to be able to focus on you as we worship you, as we praise your name this morning, Father. As we lift up Jesus Christ and as we understand the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So Lord, I just pray now that, that you would be present and Lord, that our hearts and our minds would focus on you this morning. Lord, that you would take us from the distractions of this past week and bring us into a time of being able to uh, have our eyes fixed on thee. Father, we do turn to Van Kelly and Pray for her as she recovers and as she works through these chemo treatments, Lord. And, and Father, we just ask that you would just touch her in a special way. Be with her. Be with those around her, family and friends, Lord. And allow them to be able to minister to her in, in just the right way, in just the way that she needs, Father. And Father, we do also lift up um, Margaret Rowe before you and ask that you would just be working in her life. Help her as she recovers from this procedure, the surgery, Lord, on Friday. And help her to get stronger. And help her to feel your presence with her. And to know that, that, that her family is praying for her. Father. Lord, we do think of Carolyn and, and, and her sister right now. Father, as she is recovering, Lord, that you would just be with her and guide her. And help her to feel stronger. Um, and allow Carolyn to be able to have special time to be able to, to care for her, to minister to her, Lord, in, in, in word and deed, Father. Lord, we think of this morning, and we ask now your blessing upon our time together as we open up your word and hear from you, and as we sing out words of praise to you, Father. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bring us united together to the foot of the cross. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles to Matthew, uh, chapter 27. And we're going to read a, a portion of Scripture here in Matthew 27. And then uh, I would like to then jump over to Genesis, chapter 1. Uh, you see in the bulletin, I have a title for the sermon this morning, Easter to Creation. Um, and uh, and kind of a different uh, title. And maybe we wouldn't think about it that way, but uh, hopefully as we go through this a short series here, uh, you'll understand uh, what God is doing. So Easter to creation, Matthew chapter 27, and turn to verse 45. Matthew chapter 27, and I'll start reading in verse 45, and then we'll jump to Genesis chapter 1. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded of his spirit. And behold, in verse 51, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, 
they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, if you would, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Ushers, would you come as we continue our worship? I'd like to ask Jacob Copenhaver if he would ask the blessing in the offering this morning. God, thank you for this day. Uh, thanks that we could all come here. And may this money that people are giving will go to for the further the kingdom. Amen. My strength when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek, you are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool, you are my all in all.
today we have a bit of a ballad for you. It was originally done by the Gaither Vocal Band, so we're going to give it a shot. But it's based off of the scripture in John 20, verses 1 to 10, so you can turn in your Bibles to that with me. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then did the disciples returned to their homes. So this ballad is from the perspective of Simon Peter. were barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound, half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all. Just added to my shame When at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name And even if he was alive It just wouldn't be the same But suddenly the air was filled With strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere Drove shadows from the room
He is alive. Amen. Okay, that was quiet, Kim. Kim stand up. Get, get everybody to say amen. Right. He, he's alive. Amen. That still was weak. <laughs> One more time. All right. He's alive. Okay. All right. Good. Good. So this morning I'm, I'm kind of going to talk to us from Easter uh, to creation. And, and this was really um, kind of brought on by the young adult class over in the, the side room here. They, they had a question uh, and they wanted me to come and, and kind of talk to them a little bit about this passage in Matthew. Um, and, and they were kind of going over it about, you know, Christ's death. And, uh, and they were curious as to the tombs being open and saints coming out of the tombs there in Matthew chapter 27. And uh, it is kind of interesting, isn't it? You know, you look at that passage there in, in verses 51 of Matthew chapter 27, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That, that, that's something that we look at a lot. I mean, that was even one of the questions in the, in the box in the back that we went through one, one Sunday, kind of answering what that looked like. And then it says that the curtain was torn from top to bottom, and then the earth shook. Uh, that means there was an earthquake, and the rocks split. And then in verse 52, the tombs were also open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were ro raised. And, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I mean, we don't really think about that a whole lot. You know, these tombs were open and, and these dead people rose up out of the tombs and, uh, and, and they went out. Um, what, what was happening here? Was it everywhere? Was it everywhere? You know, was it all over the known land? you know, from back then. Well, this was something that was a sign. Um, and as we, as we look at this passage, I kind of challenge the class to think about who wrote this. Right? It's, in, it's in Matthew's Gospel, and, and so Matthew, he was a Jew, and Matthew was writing to Jewish people, and he was writing for Jewish people. So when we kind of come to looking at the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, we need to take that into account. All right, and that will help our understanding, uh, help us to process what was going on here. Matthew was Jewish. He was writing to Jewish people, and he was writing for Jewish people. And so now, all of a sudden, we have Christ on the cross, and he gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was, was torn in two from top to bottom. And then the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were open. So really what you have going on here is you have a sign that God has given. He is giving this sign to the Jewish people. Matter of fact, for you and me today, he was giving this sign for you and for me, to help confirm our faith. And that was what was going on here at the death of Christ on the cross. You see, there are six signs or, or six miracles that God was giving to the Jewish people of the day. Oh, but wait, Pastor, there was a centurion there. If we read a little bit further, that centurion, those centurions, those soldiers saw this. And what happened? Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay, so 
from Easter to creation, all right? God has things that he does for confirmation, all right? Or as we look here, these six signs of the meaning of the cross for the people of the day. Number one, we have at the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the face of the earth. As Jesus hung on the cross in verse 45 of Matthew 27, darkness fell upon the face of the earth, and then at the ninth hour, Jesus gave up his spirit, and the darkness did something. The darkness lifted. The darkness lifted. It, it started to go away. And, and really what, what this is saying for you and for me and for the Jews at the time is that the substitutionary death of Jesus brings light, brings salvation to a world that is lost to sin. Six signs. Number one is, at the sixth hour there was darkness on the face of the earth. That darkness was then lifted at the ninth hour. Number two, God was, this is, this is something that is really spectacular. Um, more than spectacular, this is something that, that really, um, I think, is, is uh, awesome. And I say awesome with more substance than, than just yeah, that's awesome. But this, this is awesome in a God sense. This is awesome in a God sense. And, and that is that God, at that moment on the cross, God the Father is separated from God the Son. So the second sign here is, is that God is separated from God. For the Jewish people of the time, what do you think that meant? I think that's pretty substantial for the Jewish folks of the day. How about for you and for me? I'm, I'm teaching the sixth grade area class. And uh, you can pray for Della as, uh, as area class. We have the parents coming to our church this, this Thursday. So please be praying for, for Della and for um, uh, the parents as they come and, and the, the area class gives a presentation to the parents. That's at 2 o'clock on, on Thursday afternoon. And, uh, and, and some of these parents don't go to church. And so they'll be coming here to our church and, and we'll be able to, to get to present the gospel to them in a real special way. But... In my sixth grade class, I have one girl that's the last two weeks, I haven't even told Della this, that Della, this is really neat. She's, she's having a real struggle with understanding how, how God can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, they can all be one. And this has really got her asking me questions. And it's almost like I wish we had time to just kind of sit down with her, but we have a lot of kids in the, in the, in the sixth grade class, and, and so I'm going to give you her name, Della, and maybe you'll have over the next couple of weeks opportunity to kind of share with her a little bit about that. But, but here, God is separated from God. And in area class, the sixth grader is really struggling with the whole idea of how can God be one but yet three. I wonder what was happening at the time of Jesus' death there when he said those words and gave up his spirit. Number three, Christ, uh, he gave his life sacrificially, but he gave it. No one took his life. It says here that he gave up his spirit. An incredible sign. Because during the, the that time, they were to do what? They were to break bones in the leg. They did it to the two thieves. 
but they didn't have to do it to Christ, which, of course, filled a prophecy from Isaiah, right? Jesus gave up his life willingly, sacrificially for you and for me. So a third sign. The fourth sign, of course, then is the veil being torn. And that veil was torn from top to bottom, which is extremely significant because it was torn from top to bottom at about the three o'clock hour. That's important. Because at the three o'clock hour back in those times, the priests were very busy at the temple. So there were priests in the temple, and they were going about their business, so they were eyewitnesses of the curtain being torn. And you wonder why we, how we get this account in, in the Bible. We, I, you know, we wonder, I, I'm asked a lot of times, you know, well, who was there? Who saw it? It doesn't say who saw it. Well, it was at the 3 o'clock hour. And in the 3 o'clock hour, the priests were there. And they were busy at work in the, in the temple. And the curtain wasn't torn from the bottom to the top as if man did it but it was torn from the top to the bottom. So not only did man not do it, but the earthquake didn't do it as well. And then number five, supernaturally, there was this earthquake that happened. And then number six, tombs then were opened. So we have these six miracles or signs that that. Christ's death is substantial. And I think they lead us, as we kind of look at this, I, I think they lead us to a couple of things. A couple of things that we need to understand. I've been talking to us over the last few weeks about fellowship with God, your, your, your walk with God. What, what is this fellowship? Do you have a relationship with God? Well, within these miracles we see That God wants a covenant fellowship with you and I. God demonstrates here to us that through Christ's coming and death, that the people of God are then ushered into the most intimate fellowship that we can have. Creation in a relationship with Creator. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to Hebrews chapter, I'm not going to have you turn a whole lot of places this morning, but I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10, just so that you know that I'm not getting some of this stuff just off of the top of my head or out in, out in la-la land somewhere. But Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, there's an importance here that Hebrews 10 verses 19 and 20 share with us. It says in verse 19 to 20, therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. The importance of the death of Christ on the cross and the importance of the curtain being torn is to show us that we can enter into the presence of God, that we can have fellowship with him. Remember, Jesus, second person of the Trinity, had relationship with his disciples. They were a close-knit group for three years. Here, God once again showing mankind that he wants a relationship with you and I. Through the death of Christ, that symbolizes by the tearing of that curtain the way into the Holy of Holies. And that's important for us. And then it also shows us the end of the, um, the, the, the mosaic, you know, the, the, the sacrificial system, the, the ceremony there in the Old Testament. Jesus has taught that his coming makes those Old Testament sacrifices insufficient. It makes them obsolete. And so then you have the breaking open of the tombs. 
death and resurrection. His very death assures that you and I will be raised. So this is a sign. It's a sign of the importance of not only the death of Christ on the cross, but you also need the resurrection of Christ from the grave. So what was happening here when the tombs opened up, I believe that it was a very localized instance. It was for the Jewish people of the day, and so the tombs opened up right there. So it's not a worldwide tomb opening and everybody gets out and you got all these bodies running around, but it's one of, it happened right there. And these saints that were in Christ rose up out of the grave to show the Jewish people that they can have this relationship of Christ and it's something that happened at that time for a sign to show them of what will happen in the future. If you kind of can follow me with that. It's kind of an apocalyptic type of happening. And a confirmation of it happened now and it's going to happen when Christ returns for his beloved. Are you one of his beloved? How do you become one of his beloved? You accept him, you trust him, you believe in him. That he is the son of God and that he died for you, for your sin, to pay the penalty for your sin. And so the breaking open of those tombs is really to show us that we can have this relationship with God that wasn't ever present before. But because of what Christ has done, you and I can have this personal relationship with the Heavenly Father. So these signs, the placement here of, of what's going on, that once Jesus has been raised from the dead believers, they, they have something to do. Those saints didn't get out of the grave and then, boom, go up into heaven. They went and proclaimed Jesus. They went and proclaimed what had happened. Not only that he died, but that he rose. See, that's important. We need to understand that, that he, Jesus, was the first resurrection. That he was the first one. And their resurrection wasn't like Lazarus' resurrection. Their resurrection is like what yours and I, if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, will be one day. So if you can kind of follow along with me, it's confusing. But I think if we kind of put it into the, 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 the context of what Matthew wrote 2 and 4, I think we can kind of get the understanding of, oh yeah. So for you and I today, this is a confirmation. That one day we're going to be present with him. But right now you and I need to be at work. Telling others about what happened. What Jesus did for others. And myself. And you. Now. I want to couple that with creation. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. In the beginning God created. How did God create? Because you see, we see these things, we see these signs, and we go, that's ah, kind of confusing. But if you look at it then from the context of Genesis and creation, I think it'll help us. So, Genesis. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, there was God. He was in the beginning. And then he created everything into existence. How did he do that? He spoke. He spoke things into existence. God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be. He just speaks and things pop into existence. So then, those saints rose out of the tombs because God said, because God called them out of those tombs. The earthquake happened 
because God caused it to happen. The curtain tore because God chose for it to tear. God said, let there be, and it was. He just spoke things into existence. Existence. He just wills things into existence. He, he doesn't need to fight anybody or anything. He doesn't need to create it. He, out, out of, he, he doesn't need to... You see, this is where we kind of struggle a little bit because, you know, when we look at, at, at Adam... You know, God created out of the dust, right? But you got to look at that and go, oh, where'd the dust come from? Well, it came from God. He spoke it into existence. He willed it into existence. Where did the dust come from? Well, it came from the earth. Oh, yeah, God created the earth. What we... in theology talk about is that, that God created and, and we have this fancy word. Does anybody know the fancy word? It's a fancy word called ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. That means out of nothing. He creates out of nothing. God created from nothing. He spoke things into existence. He was but there are some people today that deny the doctrine of ex nihilo. That God, they, they say that God needed something. That he needed something. And, and a little while ago I was, I was talking to some people that were telling me something about Pennsylvania. And they were telling me about this certain place in Pennsylvania. And some of you may know it. And that's what really got me kind of processing about this, this sermon series a little bit after, after the young adult class talked to me about coming and talking about the tombs and the saints. And, and there, most state parks in Pennsylvania are, are, are closed at dusk. State parks in Pennsylvania close at dusk. But apparently there's this one place on the eastern seaboard that... that is, is like the darkest place on the East Coast. I didn't know about this. I had no, no clue. Do anybody know where that is? It's upstate. It's, what is it? Yeah, Cherry Springs. Yeah. So it's, it's up above Williamsport, right? It's up above Williamsport. And, and it, it, it's, it opens after dusk. So I don't know if you ever know, knew that or not. But apparently they have some cool stuff. Have you ever been there? No, but apparently they have, if you get there like around 10 o'clock, around a, you can get in and you, you get your seat there and everything, and about 11 o'clock, they have somebody that comes out and kind of explains the, the sky to you, um, and, and I, I never knew this, you know, and so I want to go sometime, I want to get up there and, and, and do that sometime, and, and uh, they, they explain the stars and the constellations and everything to you, and uh, and, and so I, I started to dig because this whole idea of ex nihilo, that, that God creates out of, of nothing, and, and that there are people that disagree with that. You know, I, I don't know, but for me, and, and I think as far as I've done research with the, the United Christian Church, you know, here at, at Anvil United Christian Church, we've always taken a, a traditional um, stance on the doctrine of ex nihilo because it's important. That God created out of nothing. Matter isn't something that, that God had to put up with. Matter is something that, that God wants. So he wants the dust. I started thinking about that. He wants the dandelion? You know? I mean, out, out where I live, dandelion, like the there's not a whole lot of green. There's a whole bunch of yellow right now. You know? Uh, God wants that. You know? I guess that's cool. You know? In my family, yellow is not real cool. Because you guys know Matt, he really has a hard time with allergies. And this is not a good time of year for him. Yellow is not his friend in nature. You know? And, and I... 
God wants that. Well, then take that, take that from, from there. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just out there. Take that for you and for me. You know? The doctor says, I got a spot on my face, and the doctor says in the summertime, I have to use this, this special cream on this spot on my, on my face, you know, to keep me from getting, you know, UV rays and all of that, you know, because they don't want it to turn into skin cancer, you know? So I got to put, put this cream before I go out in the sun on this one spot on my face. Did God want that spot there? For his reason, he did. Because he created me out of ex nihilo, out of nothing. Think about that as the importance of teenagers today. That God created them just the way they... Oh, put it in your own way. God created you just the way you are for his purpose, his reason, his plan. You're his creation. And then look at it and go, is there something wrong with that? God created me just the way I am. But then it also talks about God sustaining you see, I thought about that with the, this, this place, this state park and going there. That all those stars are up in the sky. And they say that you've never seen stars like that because this is like the darkest place, you know, at night is, is, at that, is that, that peak or whatever. You know, and that's on the whole East Coast. And so you get to see because there's not as much light there, you know. And so you get to see the atmosphere. And I started thinking about that. Hebrews chapter 1 shares with us that Jesus Christ is doing something. He's doing something right now. And a lot of times I think we think as Christians that Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross and he rose from the grave. And then the Bible says that he's doing something. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus came and he did his work and now he's sitting down. And a lot of times I think about that and go, that's it. You know, he's sitting down. Well, and then there's other times when I think, oh, no, he's defending us, you know. He's defending you and me in our lives to God. You know, I sin. I do something wrong. And God says, mm -hmm. Craig, he just did this, and that's wrong. And Jesus is there to say, hey, Dad, wait a minute. He's covered with my blood. He is doing that in a way, by the way. But I think sometimes maybe that's about as much as we think. You know, he's sitting there in the courtroom with, with God the Father as judge, and, and he's, you know, defending you and me. But Hebrews chapter 1, it says here that Jesus Christ is sustaining all things by his powerful word. So in Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus is sustaining you. What's that mean? That means you couldn't take a breath right now. I couldn't take a breath right now if Jesus didn't want me to. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that. That he is sustaining you and me. That means from moment to moment, folks. That doesn't mean just right this second and then next second that's different. He's sustaining his work, his salvation work is finished. But he's still active in your life today. So when we look at the signs or the miracles that happened at Jesus' death and resurrection, they go hand in hand because he is continually at work with you and me today. So what's that mean for you and for me? I think it means that we need to take the whole idea of Easter in a very important way. Is that Easter doesn't happen just once out of the year. But it, it needs to continually go on through your day. Every day. Genesis 
1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the earth. Jesus brings light out of darkness. And I pray that as you go through your week this week, as we go through this series, short series, that God will be showing you the Easter story in His creation. Put your name next every day of every week of every year. Father God, I just pray for each of us today that out of nothing you form each person that is in this building, each person that is in each house around the world. And Lord, that you want those who believe and trust in you to go and share that message with each one in each house. What a task. But one day it will be finished. And Jesus Christ will return for his bride. Oh Lord, I pray that you might be with us. That you would guide each one of us. That out of nothing you created us. We were that important to you. And Father, I ask now your blessing on us as we now lift our bodies and lift our voices and I pray that we might lift our hearts to sing this closing praise for this hour and I pray that that praise will continue on forevermore in Jesus name amen let's stand as the worship team comes take a breath without Jesus sustaining us. Lord, I need you. We need him every second of every day.
Father God, oh, how we need you every hour, every moment. Father, as I think about that and I think about this place in Pennsylvania where you can go and you can look up into the sky and you can see the stars. Lord, I'm I'm mindful that Jesus, you keep them up in that atmosphere. And as, as, as you can do that, oh Lord, you can sustain me on planet earth. Lord, that you can work through us. And so, Father, today I pray that you would just shine your face upon each one that is here in this place today. Father, that you would go with us, go before us, and allow our paths to be straight. And allow us, oh Lord, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Lord, husbands with wives. Moms and dads with children. Wives with husbands. Oh, Father, that you would allow us to be Christ's love to those around us. In Jesus' name.